So today we're going to be discussing Sigismund, the Eternal Crusader, Dawn's favourite son. There's a bunch of new lore now about Sigismund, um, everything that we've learned in his early life, um, big, massive, juicy bits of lore, like Sigismund was not actually meant to go into the Imperial Fists, and I'm still shocked if the Legion that actually took him actually had their way with Sigismund. So let's just jump in and discuss all of this awesome stuff. As always, this video will be packed from start to finish with spoilers. If you don't want to be spoiled, then get out of the video now. This is your first and only warning. So this book is basically set up just like the Valdor book. I think this is what they're going for with these formats of these like character books where he's being interviewed by a remembrancer. That remembrancer is Solomon Voss and he's asking Sigismund about different parts of his life and that's where we get like glimpses back into his past um you know during the crusade and all that type of stuff so sigismund was recruited from the slums and this kind of mirrors the the journey of Helbrecht now with the black templars because we now know with his new lore and everything like that that he was also recruited from the slums he was actually watched over by uh, the custodians Helbrecht was. So it's kind of like a mirror image of Helbrecht and Sigismund, their lives. I, well, that's the way I connected it anyway. And we learned that like, the big thing is it wasn't the Imperial Fists who actually come and got Sigismund. It was the Night Lords. Sigismund was going to be put into the Night Lord Legion. Now, the only reason he wasn't put into the Night Lord Legion is because when he was taken to Luna, like all recruits are, that's where they're given like tests and they receive implants and everything like that. And because of those tests, they determined that he was actually best suited for the Seventh Legion instead of the Eighth Legion. So this is why Sigismund actually went into the Imperial Fists. Imagine, just imagine like... Um, an alternate universe where Sigismund is actually a Night Lord. How bloody scary would that be? Sigismund with the skill of a blade, but also a Night Lord. And don't say that's just Sevatar, because Sigismund never lost to Sevatar. We'll get onto that in a second as well. The book confirms that him and Fafnir Ran actually joined the Legion at the same time, which is um, pretty awesome for me because I've always seen Fafnir Ran as Sigismund's best friend, like they are technically BFFs, and now this kind of su supplants that kind of feeling for me that these two grew up together in the Legion. They've always had each other's back, and it's great because Sigismund is Sigismund and Fafnir Ran is Fafnir Ran. Two absolute fantastic characters, two characters who are close to each other. Now, Sigismund first met Rogel Dawn along with Fafnir Ran after they both successfully passed the trials to become an Imperial Fist Space Marine. Now, this happened in a place called the Temple of Oves. Now, for those people who don't know what that is, it's basically like sacred ground for Imperial Fist. It's where like they list all the dead and everything like that, and they're forever remembered as, you know, sacrificing themselves for Dawn, the Imperium, the Emperor, all that kind of jazz. So in this place, this is where they first met Rogel Dawn um, to bow down to him and give their oath of service to him the Emperor, and of course, the Imperium. Now, of course, Sigismund didn't become a Black Templar straight away. That doesn't happen. You have to, you know, earn that rank. It's one of, like, a ceremony, like, really high up rank to achieve. And now we know where he went. He actually joined the 45th Assault Cadre, and he actually served, of course, alongside Fafnir Ran. I tell you, we need a book of this, like, buddy cop tale of these two just purging their way across the galaxy, like, early crusade. It would be bloody fantastic. Now, it states in the book that he actually became one of the Templar Brethren um, just after Lionel Johnson was found. So, around the time Lionel Johnson was found by the Emperor, this is the time that Sigismund joined the Templar Brethren. Again, he's not a commander in the Temple of Brethren, he's just a normal Temple of Brethren soldier, or should I say recruit, or brother, or a part of the brotherhood fighting in that service to, to, to bear the Teutonic Cross, let's say. Now, we all know Sigismund as one of, if not the most favoured son of Rogel Dawn. Now, how did he kind of start that step towards 
the peak of his father's um, affections. Well, it actually happened um, because of the Iron Hands. So thank you, Iron Hands players and Iron Hands fans, because there was a campaign where Rogel Dawn and Ferris got involved and they had a massive disagreement. Now, there's this empire called the Astranai Machine Empire, and it's basically like um, uh, a set of Mars who never came to the compliance of the Imperium like Mars did. And Mars hate these chaps. So Mars actually petitioned Ferris Manus to come in because they were close to Ferris and destroy them. They were like, please destroy all their citizens, all their machines, everything. Give them no terms at all. We want them wiped out. Now, Rogel Dawn also got involved in this, and Rogel Dawn was like, no, we don't do this. This is not part of what the Great Crusade is. We always offer terms for these people to join us to help grow the Imperium to be a part of of the Imperium. Ferris, of course, disagreed because he took the side of the Mechanicum, and this is when they had this massive disagreement. Horace obviously turns up, and he's like the mediator between these two. They bring in Sigismund into the room between, like, you know, Dawn, Horace, and Ferris, because Sigismund was actually part of a party that was sent out to um, basically, you know, see what the Astrani is all about, and they were ambushed, and um, everyone was wiped out except Sigismund. So Sigismund's brought in for his, you know, knowledge of the, of basically the enemies and how to proceed and what's the best way to go. Now, Sigismund tells them how to actually win and, like, what to do. Horace, you know, gives a little bit of tweaks because Horace is being Horace, um, and hearing all of this, Ferris gets super, super mad because Ferris has basically just had his entire plan, everything, you know, pulled from underneath him by this lonely Templar brethren. This this Astartes, he's not even a Primarch, he's an Astartes, so he is super mad at Sigismund. So after they fight this empire, because of course they don't want to join the Imperium, this is when Ferris has basically his best warrior challenge Sigismund because it's all about honor, right? Because, you know, it, he wants to reclaim his honor. Ferris fell, feels like he's been done wrong and this is the way to, like, get Sigismund back and also maybe get Dawn back um, as way in a way. Now, of course, Sigismund wins this fight and Ferris actually jumps down and um, interrupts the duel. He actually, like, walks in and says, right, enough is enough because, again, he doesn't want to be embarrassed again because Sigismund is just being Sigismund in a fight. So Ferris and Sigismund are like having a stare down in the middle of this duel. Sigismund's not backing down. And this is this is what I love about Sigismund. Sigismund will take no back step even against a Primarch. And we've seen this. We've seen this in, like, the Siege of Terror and everything like that. If you want to go check out that animation, I'll post it uh, at the top of uh, this video. It's right up there. Beep, 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 beep. Um, but yeah, he will not back down. Ferris is like, you know, are you really going to kill a brother over this, and Sigismund's like, I don't want anyone to die today because of pride, and it's, you know, it's Ferris's pride, it's, Fer this is Ferris's problem, um, not Sigismund's problem, so Ferris basically gets his champion to yield, and, um, again, he's, like, just, like, walks off, and then, like, Horace, like, puts his arm around him, and, like, you know, talks to him as he, like, walks off down the corridor, but this is where Dawn actually notices Sigismund. Dawn's been watching this the entire time. The old stern face of Rogel Dawn watching like, mm, yes, my son, I am proud. And he actually thinks like, you know, this Astartes has something big about him because he actually stood up to a Primarch. It takes a lot to do this. So he's now on Rogel Dawn's radar for the first time. Now, of course, years pass and we see Sigismund as now like a Templar captain and he's an ultimate badass. Now, during like the Great Crusade, it was like a common thing to see warriors from each legion actually spend time with each other. And this is something that Gilliman has now brought back in. And this was the idea of like the gray shields and stuff like that so they can all learn off each other and they can all feel closer to each other this is where we see Sigismund with Khan and Sevatar we learn that you know of course he fights with Khan he becomes very very um, um friendly with Khan and this is where he learns to take up the chains around his hand to attach it to weapons which would of course become a massive practice that the Black Templars now use in everyday life now the 
the actual new law we have attached to this now is that Sigismund actually didn't get sent to the World Eaters. He volunteered to be sent to the World Eaters. He wanted to go there. The Imperial Fists, who actually went to the World Eaters, um, were sent there basically to assess what was going on with the World Eater Legion. Because at this time, they had just been reunited with Angron. And the Butcher's Nails had begun to be part of their legion. And, you know, there was a lot of questions being asked. So that, that contingent of Imperial Fists were kind of like there for the old brotherhood sharing traits and stuff. But also kind of maybe like as spies as well. That's the way I took it. To see actually what is going on within the Imperial Fists. And of course, as I mentioned, this is where Sigismund and Khan met and everything else that followed with that. Now, I'm sure everyone's asking, what about Sevatar? Does it mention anything about Sevatar? It does. So, Sigismund and um, the Imperial Fist um, land on a planet called uh, Sharut. Hopefully, I'm pronouncing that right. Now, for those of you who don't know, this is basically what happened with Conrad Kurz and Dawn. You know, where Dawn got his throat ripped out. Basically, the event's covered in The Dark King. I think, it's, is, it, is it The Dark Knight or The Dark King? I don't know. It's a book from way back by Dan Abner, if I'm not mistaken. And this is what covered was the duel with Sevatar and like what in what like what basically happened into there because there's a lot of fan theories did Sevatar win did he not win no he technically didn't win because he basically headbutted which wasn't allowed which basically got him disqualified now the way this is kind of cleared up is that Sigismund and Khan agree uh, to fight until the other yields it's made that you know no other strikes can be made it's all about you know you know the blades and the axe and stuff like that and um, Sevatar is a part of this but like Sevatar is like he's shrugging and stuff like that so like when he has his fight and stuff and um he headbutts um uh, that's counted as a forfeit but Sevatar is like well I never really agreed to that you know and you know i never said i agree to this I, I, I said i'd fight but i never agreed to it so in sevatar's eyes he won and uh in everyone else's eyes it's not because they all agree to this rules and sevatar was like well i never heard those kind of rules you know i do what i want kind of thing so again it's down to how you want to look at it did sevatar win did sevatar lose is it a draw whatever it is i'm always going to take a civic uh, like a sevatar lost it because sigismund um uh, stuck to the rules and sevatar didn't but of course people go there's no rules in war well this is not a raw uh, this this is not a war it's like the cages so sit down sigismund's the best now the last big reveal or the last big ending should we say a part of this book is that we get confirmation that sigismund actually met the emperor which for me was massive i'd never thought sigismund met the emperor in his entire service maybe it's like a voice in his head or something like that but it's actually confirmation that sigismund met the emperor at ulinor so when ulinor's happening you know when all the primarchs were there they basically brought all their you know favored sons in the same room and the emperor actually met with all his sons and all their like you know, first captains and their favoured sons in that room as well. He went around and spoke to each one of them in person. And the book kind of ends with, like, this vision given from the Emperor to Sigismund, basically stating that there is going to be only war. Like, the Emperor knew that there would be only war. I know there's going to be a lot of theories, like, the Emperor planned the entire heresy, like it's always been. But it basically, for me, as I read it, it's 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 the Emperor giving Sigismund the sword, which is basically... It's, it's eternal, this. This this fight will last forever. Anyway, Chaperunios, that's enough waffling from me. Hopefully, it comes out on Audible very, very soon because I can't wait to get it on that. As much as I love this, um, I'm not really a big reader. I'm sure most of you know this by now. Um, I just love to sit back and just listen to um, um, audiobooks and stuff. Um, but I have to give it to John French. Um, love this. I thought it was a fantastic read. I think everything that John French does with uh, the Imperial Office and also the um, Iron Warriors as well. Um, I think he's fantastic. I think he understands both of these the legions, how they act with each other, um, their characters, their primarchs, perfectly. So anything that he writes, anything to do with the Imperial Office, I know it's going to be a absolutely fantastic bloody time. Anyway, enough waffling from me. Thank you for coming. Thank you for watching. Have a great day and bye-bye.